so we'll talk about plasticity. In particular, our attempt to understand plasticity. Uh, as you know, it's an old field, but recently people started to think about, uh, in physics in particular, uh, what is yield, uh, plastic yield, like uh, what kind of phase transition it is, and uh, so away from phenological models. And that was driving our efforts and led ultimately to the necessity to come up with a kind of novel approach, what we think is novel, to, to model plasticity. Uh, okay. So this is a result of a work of, uh, with many uh, collaborators at different stages. But what I'm going to talk about mostly was uh, uh, work of a postdoc, Umut Salman, and a PhD student, Roberto Baggia. All right, so let's start with uh, what is well known. It's a continuum, uh, say, plasticity or crystal plasticity theory. It has several elements. Uh, the idea of the yield surface, uh, the idea of a flow rule, the mathematical models behind it, and some non-trivial uh, mathematical problems, and a lot of work have been done along these lines. So uh, what's the problem with this approach? Why, it, why uh, something has to, why, why one would want to go beyond this? Uh, recent uh, improvement in, in uh, uh, experimental uh, measurements emphasize the presence of fluctuations. So instead of, for instance, see, sitting on a particular point in the yield surface, which conventional theory assumes and also uh, postulates the kind of smooth nature of this process, people started to see, uh, many of you know, the, the fluctuations. And the first idea was that, okay, there are fluctuations, but they have Gaussian uh, fluctuations, and uh, it's a kind of succession of events uh, of the same type. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then people, and that's why you, you can just smoothen it and, uh, and neglect it. And even though fluctuations were seen from the 30s in experiment, uh, experimentalists would just uh, smoothen the curves and report uh, fixed yield surface. But more recently, people started to see these fluctuations in details. First, they start to see that they're quite intense. Despite the smooth nature of, of those curves, if you look at velocities, uh, you, you see quite intense activity here. And then uh, uh, it came out that fluctuations, in fact, may be very important to study. First, they can carry information about the state of the material. Uh, if, uh, for instance, uh, the closeness to fatigue failure and things like this. So one should listen to them and, ba and based on the nature of these fluctuations, try to come up with the uh, methods of non-destructive testing. And the second, fluctuations can interfere with forming of submicron samples. Uh, of course, when we bend the spoon, the presence of these fluctuations is not important. But if our spoon is a submicron size, then to control the process, we need to understand or, for instance, suppress these fluctuations. That's, for instance, the reason why Turbulence studies and fluid mechanics emphasizes fluctuations because when we are in a plane, we are at the scale of those fluctuations and we feel them, or in the earthquakes, we experience them, but when we bend the spoon, we don't see it. Now it becomes an issue. So the question is how to come up with a theory that would uh, describe those fluctuations. But first, what's the nature of these fluctuations? Uh, people started to measure uh, by, say, acoustic emission, uh, 
the statistics of the events, first they understood that uh, in many cases fluctuations have strong intermittent component, and then they show long tails, the distributions. Uh, so kind of power law tails over many decades. And also in some cases people saw that the cell structures also have a fractal uh, nature. So which says that uh, plastic flow uh, is a highly hierarchical, self-organized process which has a scale-free kind of uh, scaling over at least the range. We can call it inertial range. So in a sense, it's a process somewhat similar to turbulence in, in many respects. And that caused an interest in modeling this and finding the tools that would allow one to reproduce those, uh, uh, those uh, fluctuation responses, uh, spatial and temporal. Also, more recent discovery was that when uh, crystals become submicron, these fluctuations, of course, start to be dominating the response. And the smaller the crystal, the more this power law uh, is uh, kind of uh, evident uh, in, 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 in the statistics, that the longer are the tails. Uh, for instance, bulk crystals, uh, BCC, they, they usually uh, don't show long tails, but uh, HCP they, uh, crystals, they, for instance, I showed mostly uh, uh, HCP and FCC crystals, while, while BCC crystals at, at a small scale also show power law. So it's, it's a kind of uh, universal behavior at small scale, and this needs to be understood. I'm sorry, what is the temperature of your uh, temperature here, I, I guess it's a, it's a ambient temperature. So te te temperature apparently it's a thermal phenomena, and uh, the increasing temperature kind of takes us away from power laws, it brings us more to Gaussian behavior. So uh, those are kind of we can say it's zero temperature, and everything that I'm going to talk about is a kind of zero temperature type of uh, plastic response, because it's becoming more and more visco viscous as you increase temperature, and that corrupts the features that we want to emphasize. Yeah. I ask it because, you know, I, I'm sorry. Sorry, uh, yeah. Uh, because in aluminum scandium, alloys, we have the precipitation kinetics. So it's linking also what is a deep phase region or homogeneous system. Yeah, I, I, I see. I see what you are saying. And there are other fluctuational phenomena that uh, I'm not going to talk about, like Parteven Le Chatelier effect. Those uh, related to the presence of salutes, and uh, there are other type of uh, processes which are more described by limit cycles and uh, in dynamics. Uh, but uh, they don't have this uh, characteristic long tails. So this is a purely a thermal uh, effect that we want to uh, address. Yes? I'm just wondering what the strain, there is a cluster, what's your straining here? What's the sort of mechanical operation that the straining is referring to? It's a, it's a hard device. Uh, it's a controlled <laughs> strain, yes. It's a micro pillars, yeah. Uh, yes, yes. Okay, so first we want to uh, identify uh, scales of interest. Uh, uh, so you see, I cut here because everything that was uh, talked about yesterday was to the left of this uh, range. It's, uh, or at least uh, overlapping with this range where the electrons uh, uh, govern. Uh, so we are leaving this aside. It, Again, it may be important, but it remains to be shown because still these fluctuations are detected by kind of non-quantum measurements and uh, even though they're microscopic at a scale of kind of uh, human uh, size, they are, uh, they are still uh, above the quantum uh, scales. So, uh, so what do we have here? We have our continuum plasticity, crystal plasticity theory. We call it PDE. So there is a system of degenerate PDEs, very complex and interesting mathematically that people have been studying here. Now there is also molecular dynamics. Let's call it ODE kind of part. Uh, so uh, the problem with PDE, it's too smooth. Uh, 
The problem with ODEs is uh, we uh, to observe these fluctuations, you need statistics. For statistics, you need a lot of dislocations. You need thousands of dislocations simultaneously interacting. And uh, this seems to be still uh, outside of the range of uh, uh, scales uh, accessible by, by molecular dynamics. Now, there is, of course, in this range in between, uh, uh, there are several other methods. So our method, we call it mesoscopic, but there are other mesoscopic methods. Uh, there is, for instance, discrete dislocational dynamics. Now, it's, it's a very nice way of assessing long-range interaction of dislocations governed by linear elasticity. But uh, here, during these avalanches that are responsible for these uh, fluctuations, you may have simultaneous nucleations of thousands of dislocations and annihilation and, and escape on the boundaries. So what uh, in the DDD kind of world is called local rules is not just a minor thing that is a kind of uh, uh, um, present in, in the code. Uh, it's 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 playing dominant role. So it's it's more about this short range interaction than about long range interaction. Those fluctuations. So uh, since many things are put by hand there, one would like to to have a method, for instance, where this type of topological changes uh, do not need to be controlled by, uh, for instance, uh, by hand. So uh, so. There are other methods like uh, uh, phase field methods, but uh, uh, the problem with those that they operate with scalar phase fields, so they don't really account appropriately for geometrical nonlinearity, the presence of rotations. And, and so uh, in a sense, what we are proposing can be somehow linked to kind of tensorial phase field approach. So uh, I'm going to slowly go through the ideas that led us to uh, kind of development of this method. So we are located this, and uh, in fact, we'll use neither ODE nor PDEs, but uh, learn from both of them simultaneously. Okay, so the main motivation comes from very old model of Ludwig Prantl, who is behind many different things in, in mechanics. Uh, he tried to understand what's happening in plasticity and what's the origin of yield, and he came up with this model. It's exactly from his paper. So if you translate it on a more simple language, you may think about a particle in a periodic landscape being driven by a spring. So uh, you can come up with the energy of this system. There is a periodic landscape, there is a spring, and there is a tilt of this landscape. So you have a controlling parameter epsilon, which is position of, say, this point, and alpha is the position of this point, which is a plastic strain, and epsilon is, let's say, total strain. And you can uh, take just, so this is pure elasticity. Uh, there is uh, no kind of plastic dissipation, uh, which in continuum mechanics is described by uh, dissipative potentials that are homogeneous function of degree one. Here it's on Zagarian, it's just viscous model. That's how he saw it. But when you look at this uh, system, uh, uh, some of you may have a physical experience of this because uh, in the ski lifts long ago, when I was uh, younger, the lifts were what in France is called tir fesse. You kind of being pulled by the by the uh, by the lift, and you are just driving behind in your skis, and and there is a very soft spring. So if the spring is very uh, stiff. Then you just follow this landscape and it's a smooth process. But if the spring is uh, soft, and this was understood also in the depending, general depending theory, you kind of get stuck in one of the wells and then you have a rapid transition to another well. So, uh, and you can see it mathematically, of course, uh, because there are some relaxational oscillations behind it. So you, you, you see that your yield is becoming kind of wiggly kind of curve here. Uh, 
this is stress, this is strain, you go up, you go down. So there is no distinct yield surface, but there is some area where these jumps are happening. So this is the main idea of this, uh, of our approach ultimately. You, you don't use plasticity explicitly, you use elasticity, but in a very uh, bumpy energy landscape that apparently comes from micro scale, and that's what we're going to discuss. Uh, and, and then uh, if the driving is much slower than the viscosity here, then you have a set of discontinuous processes and that's where dissipation takes place. So, but behind basically is the, uh, the elasticity theory. So it's a kind of elastic theory. I call it elastic model of plasticity. Okay, so now where is this periodic landscape uh, in, in plasticity? So uh, we understand that plasticity is related to, uh, uh, to what is called sleep. Uh, but if you, uh, what is sleep? It's just a kind of translation of one part of the crystal uh, with respect to another part. But if you relabel the particle, the, the bonds here, so the particles are the same, you see that it's a kind of a lo localized shear. Uh, localized shear that bring the system back to itself. That uh, gave rise to the concept of lattice invariant shears, which are deformations of crystal lattice that bring the lattice to itself. And you can easily imagine that uh, you, you ultimately get a periodic energy landscape. So how to get it from micro scale? You can have a, uh, several particles, and for instance, you can use interatomic potential. Sorry for those who know that it's not an adequate model, but you can instead use something that Gabor was telling us, so some kind of sophisticated scheme of computing energies of the state. And as you increase the size of the system, uh, the energy uh, the, as a function of, of shear becoming more and more periodic. So, so that brings the idea that you should use some kind of uh, 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 elements, uh, finite elements, where you assume that deformation is homogeneous, and then uh, made out of these elements, the, uh, the whole system, uh, consisting of these discrete elements. And uh, this, each element has a periodic energy landscape. Okay, so what dislocations would mean in this language? Uh, so for instance, this is a classical description of dislocations that uh, where the bonds, so again, the position of particles here on A and B are the same, but the bonds are connected differently. So here there is original uh, bonds, uh, like it was before the deformation took place, the deformation of kind of partial uh, sleeping this upper layer over the lower layer, uh, while here there is a relabeling. This is a conventional description, and the relabeling took place here, and you have here extra uh, atomic layer, while here there is a continuity, but you see the, those uh, largely sheared areas, they correspond to just another minimum of your, uh, in your energy landscape. Okay, so for instance, the simplest model is the scalar model. It's still a toy model uh, of elastic type. So you, uh, you for instance, uh, have a rails, let's say, you move uh, you move your elements only, uh, the displacement only has a horizontal component, so which means there are only two components of strains. There is no epsilon 2, 2, there is epsilon 1, 2, and epsilon 1, 1. Those are discrete uh, representations of them. And let's say one of them is a periodic with respect to shear, or say this angle, it's periodic, and with respect to another, uh, like stretching of this bond, it's say quadratic, and you may have random uh, also tilting, which represents the defects. So one can come up with the energy, and one can drive quasi-statically such a system uh, with, say, viscous dynamics, uh, or in the limit of uh, quasi-static loading, it would be just uh, uh, incremental energy minimization. So, uh, 
In this way, you can get plasticity with fluctuating behavior along the yield, and you can get, uh, fluctu uh, you can get uh, 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 intermittent fluctuations with the long tails. So, uh, in fact, you can also get a fractal structure of the dislocation configurations uh, with uh, uh, kind of uh, correlations uh, with long tails. Mm, okay, but uh, this is still a, a toy model because it, uh, it doesn't describe, uh, it still has a uh, kind of uh, periodicity with respect to scalar variable. But in fact, what we want is tensorial periodicity. We want uh, an energy that is periodic, but in the space of strains. So what are the strains? Strains are, you can say, just a, a metric tensors describing the, the change of the angle of the reference uh, uh, vectors and, uh, and the change of their lengths. So this is a, this our metric tensor. So we want to have a periodicity of the energy in this space, yes? And uh, we want to represent the lattice. For instance, in 2D, so to represent the lattice, uh, we want to find what are, which states are equivalent uh, 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 in this periodic landscape. Just, I, I will repeat here that mm, to characterize this energy landscape, in fact, the minimal characterization is just one half of one period. If we know the energy is in one half of the period, we can construct energy for any strains. So that what is left for microscopic models is to come up with, with this curve, this piece of this curve. You see here we have a smooth ones and we have piecewise quadratic because piecewise quadratic uh, allows us to, to interpret it as a soft spin models, integrate out completely elasticity and reduce it to, uh, to uh, integer uh, valued uh, 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 automaton. Uh, so, uh, but what I want to say that from micro scale, we only need uh, half of this period. Yes? Yeah. Right, just, just to understand a little bit. So the theta and the psi here, you can think of as like the elastic and the plastic strain. So is the U then a dispersed? No, they're both elastic. They're both elastic. Everything is elastic. We haven't said so far what is plastic strain, but I can tell you now that, for instance, when you're inside the well here, uh, this is elastic uh, deformation. But when you change the well, this is a plastic deformation. So here, plastic deformation is described by integer valued uh, variable. So plastic strain is quantized in this sense. So, so the U is the U are horizontal displacements, yeah. Okay, so, uh, so the group is, uh, it's called JL2Z. It's uh, uh, the equivalence uh, of the energy is controlled by this transformation of, met of metric tensor C. And M are uh, matrices with integer entries and determinant plus or equal one. Plus or equal one related to, uh, to reflections. Uh, so as, as you see, the plastic strain is this kind of discrete variable, uh, but it's a matrix valued. It's a kind of metric value spin. In fact, those ideas are not new. So, uh, they probably go back to Jerry Erickson, who in, already in the 70s and in the 80s were saying that one should, in continuum elasticity, consider energies that are globally periodic. Then there were also work of others, including students of Erickson, who uh, constructed some examples of this periodic landscape. Uh, but the problem is that if you use it in a continuum framework, then the energy is highly non-convex. And if you, for instance, look for global minimum uh, and do relaxation, then you are getting fluids, essentially. So one should not go to global minimum. But here, we also have a finite scale of our particle, effective particle that is a cutoff scale that allows one to have a non-trivial minima here. 
So we're not putting higher gradients and length scales like uh, in some phase field models, but putting them in, in the form of the uh, finite scale of, of, of an elastic element. So how does this, the erickson pateri neighborhood fit into all this? It's coming. Okay. Okay. So, uh, uh, yeah, for instance, in 2D, we have three components of uh, our metric tensor. And if we want to stay in determinants equal to one, which is a non-volumetric part, where the symmetry is operating, because lattice invariant shears, they, they preserve uh, volume, then we are essentially in the C space, we are living on this hyperboloid, determinants equal to one. So, but this hyperboloid, we need to now divide into equivalent uh, periodicity domains uh, based on the symmetry. So that's how it looks like, because this uh, gel to z group, it's a finite, uh, it's a discrete infinite subgroup of the group of uh, isometries of hyperbolic plane, and it uh, creates a tessellation that's uh, called Dedekind tessellation that's known from uh, 19th century. Uh, that's basically division of this hyperboloid on equivalent uh, domains. So the minimal domain, you remember I was talking about one half of this parabola, it's uh, this domain, gray, it's uh, put here as D. So for instance, uh, when, if you start with a square lattice, and shear it horizontally, you can get an equivalent square lattice, and this is this point S3. And if you shear it vertically, you can also get an equivalent lattice, it's S2. But in fact, all squares here are all equivalent energy wells. So one has to think about uh, Landau type of potential, but with infinite number of equivalent energy wells. So uh, it's convenient to project it, uh, this two-dimensional surface. And there are two well-known projections, Poincaré on a disk and Klein on the upper uh, uh, complex plane. And here we, again, with squares, we show the equivalent square lattices. And uh, with triangles, equivalent uh, uh, triangular lattices with hexagonal symmetry. Uh, okay, so uh, this is another representation, and this is the Piteri neighborhood. So, so you remember this D was only this domain here, but now we do also reflections. So we reconstruct the whole energy wells. So if we combine, so for elasticity, it's important this whole area. This is essentially elastic domain. So when you get out of this domain, you have plastic deformation which means that you are moving to another well. So another well here, for instance, this would be this type of domain. It's just that it's distorted because we want to represent infinite number of wells on the finite domain, so we have to squeeze them uh, more and more as we get to the boundary. So if we construct now the energy, so for instance, with the dominating phase, square phase, so it should be a minimum of the energy, uh, uh, but then, for instance, this triangular phase, uh, tri triangular lattices would represent uh, uh, saddle points, degenerate in this case, and then there would be other square lattices, again, minima. So those are, uh, for instance, five equivalent square lattices that are distinguished by lattice invariant shears. Uh, in fact, everything is happening inside this neighborhood. So when you get out of this neighborhood, you are getting to equivalent wells. So you can think about uh, passing this point as uh, being reflected back uh, to, from P to P prime and then going further and coming back to, to O. So, o pr so this lattice is exactly equivalent to this one. Uh, uh, so if you remove bones, it's the same points. So essentially, we need, uh, so the only thing we need to operate plasticity is to know the energy surface inside this, uh, this neighborhood. Even though, even I said we, we may uh, 
only constructed in, in this triangle, triangular domain. And then we know it for any strain and we can uh, do our uh, kind of uh, minimization procedure. So uh, that's where we need maybe electrons and the uh, methods that uh, are currently developed. Uh, but so far, since we are making first tests, we at least to capture those fluctuations, it was enough to use uh, uh, interatomic potentials that were created to make square lattice as a, as a, as a ground state here. Uh, to 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 make these first runs. Yes. Question: Is the connectivity of this Poincaré map reflective of transitions in the lattice? Like, if you have two <coughs> two points in that map um, that are directly connected, does that mean that? Uh, what do you mean connected? You you can you can travel on this uh, uh, everywhere. Uh, uh, for instance, go, uh, here what we show O prime, it's going from this square to this square. So it's a path, for instance, pure shear, simple shear, sorry. Simple shear connects those, those two points. Uh, and then you can go further. Uh, and uh, depending on where you go, you activate one slip plane or another slip plane. It's actually travel in this. Uh, uh, we are going to see how landscape looks like because it's still kinematics, but we would need to construct the energy on top of it. But I was asking because to accommodate any arbitrary deformation, you need five independent you know, transformations. So does that mean that you would have, you, you would have to have, this would allow for five, in, a minimum of five independent paths? This is still 2D because you are talking about 3D, yes? Uh, 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 yes, the here, uh, but uh, to accommodate, uh, you see, you are talking in terms of uh, uh, crystal plasticity, which operates with mechanisms. Mechanisms are, in fact, a paths here. So instead of putting these discrete points, people would say there is a valley. Uh, there is a valley which corresponds to plastic mechanism. And then which kind of deformations can be composed by allowing anywhere inside this valley. So for instance, the whole path here would be available. While uh, this model, it, which uh, again, it, its task is to capture fluctuations, it sees the barrier between them. So not all states are available in a sense. Mostly, I, I mean, in, in uh, particular realizations, you will see that you, may, uh, you mostly concentrate around here and around here. So, so this kind of reasoning that any deformation can be constructed is based on continualization of this. Okay, now, so in terms of conventional plasticity, you see we are still using the, the language of continuum theory, even though our theory is discrete, essentially. So uh, uh, we are operating with plastic strain, but now it is given by integer-valued metrics. So it's, we can talk about quantized plastic uh, strain. <coughs> Uh, so it's all elastic, but uh, switching between the wells uh, uh, corresponds to activating of this M. So in a sense, I'm saying that if you have a generic uh, deformation, generic metric tensor, we can find its analog in this uh, Piteri, uh, ericsson piteri neighborhood by computing, by doing the so-called reduction and computing this matrix. <coughs> M, integer valued matrices. So it's enough to know only the behavior of energy inside this neighborhood, and then we can compute energy of any state. But uh, uh, for this, we need to, need to know the magnitude of this discrete plastic strain. Okay, now there is a problem with linearization of this. For instance, uh, if you look at these two paths connect, so suppose this is our original square well, and those are the two equivalent square wells. So if we do uh, geometric linearization, we are essentially looking at the tangent plane here and uh, near this point. So these two paths overlap. So we neglect this alpha square term in, uh, along this path, and they overlap. That's why in classical crystal plasticity, where they use linear elasticity, they, they don't know uh, very often which uh, uh, 
slip plane to activate because uh, uh, they they are equivalent and they have to have a special rules uh, that tell uh, which uh, plane should be activated and when, while the nonlinear theory would uh, do it by itself. Okay, now uh, the potential. So uh, this is our element. It uh, can be represented by a triangle. So to compute the energy of the affine deformation of this triangle, you have to use a Cauchy-Born type of procedure. And for instance, this is a potential that we used that uh, puts the ground state in the square uh, state. And that produces this type of energy landscape represented in a Poincaré plane. So what are we seeing here? So the blue regions are low valleys. The very blue points are neighborhoods of, of the equivalent minima. The red areas, they are truncated because those are huge hills here comparing to these valleys. That's where the elastic deformation is. For instance, if you go in this direction, you encounter a very steep uh, increase. If you go in this direction, you, you see more or less a valley, and then there is this kind of uh, triangle lattices that plays the role of these cross uh, uh, points uh, where the system has to decide whether to activate, to go to the left or to the right, to the left or to the right. Those binary choices are activating of one of the two equivalent uh, 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 sleep mechanisms. Okay, uh, again, the conventional crystal plasticity would just make the, 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 those paths uniformly available, zero energy paths, but it would introduce some friction along these paths, and that's what classical continuum crystal plasticity is in this framework. While in instead, we have this periodic landscape, but it's uh, like in phase field, but it's a uh, kind of complex periodicity accounting for geometrical nonlinearity. Okay, so that's examples of different simple shears that uh, the barriers can be quite different. For instance, along this simple shear path uh, uh, with a different orientation, you have a low barriers uh, around some other paths, also periodic but larger barriers, but the path that go through this red area, it, it kind of uh, is, you have very high uh, energy barriers. So, this, in a sense, the system has to decide how to navigate in this complex landscape. As we load the system, each, each element is kind of traveling inside this landscape, and, uh, and that's what uh, plasticity is all about. Okay, for instance, single dislocation, what do we have? Now, of course, since our elements are effectively represent uh, maybe 50 of uh, atomic units, uh, we have a blurred description of a dislocation. It's a bit like with the uh, phase field uh, models that represent phase boundaries, uh, not at the scale of the real thickness of phase boundaries that are the nanometers, but at a, at a larger scale, but with a kind of maintaining, for instance, value of surface energy by modifying energy landscape. So is, that, is the choice arbitrary left or what do we, what, you're invoking a element size, you know, what, what is that size or what's going to happen if you refine your elements or make it broader? Or uh, yeah, okay. So what controls the choice of the element is that we need to, to, to have, by our ab initio methods, enough of the energy wells that we want to be present in our description. Because when the element is too small, we don't have periodicity uh, sufficient to, to capture enough of the wells. So. So if you, if you want an effect, if you want to, to see kind of double sleep, triple sleep, all kinds of effect like this, you need to have bigger element, yeah. So that's what uh, controls uh, the, the choice. But, ele but the size of the element is a physical parameter here. It's a cutoff scale. It's like a epsilon in, in phase field models. Now, uh, you, you have, of course, the right kind of... Uh, 
a rate of decay of the fields, so like in continuum, continuum theory, far away from dislocation. So dislocation, I, by the way, it's just a path in this energy landscape connecting to wells. Uh, so, but you also capture the core. Uh, it's not, uh, we made comparison with molecular dynamics. We, uh, uh, we quantitatively, we don't capture the, the, the exact uh, distribution there, but qualitatively you, you capture and it's much better than just a singular field with the right decay the, uh, uh, far away. And we also, for instance, capture this fact that the core, this is a simple shear and the core goes through triangular phase. That's what is uh, in dislocation theory is called partials, uh, Shockley partials, because you go to some intermediate state that is the higher symmetry state. Here it's, it's a hexagonal lattice. And so these two, co two components effectively, they represent two partials. So there are other details that I cannot talk about. Here maybe I, uh, this is an example of what happens when you decompose homogeneous state and you have massive nucleation, the kind of snapshot. Uh, uh, you see, you start with the all points here. This is configurational space. So those points represent different elements. So they were all f uh, in the square state, but when you load it and the state become unstable, the points spread out. In particular, they occupy these two wells, which means the system activates uh, two slip directions and uh, two slip planes, and it does it automatically. Yeah. Yes. So, um, do you know of any experiment or simulation evidence which shows massive nucleation? Yes. Uh, uh, so, uh, there no, no, are... No, simulation meaning not, not, not phase field or what you do. I'm talking about, say, atomistic simulations or experiments where massive nucleation happens. Because, uh, you know, the understanding of avalanches is not massive nucleation. It's, there are tons of dislocations or maybe a few, they move, but it's nucleation is not. Yeah, okay. here, here we emphasize nucleation because we take a carefully prepared initial state, which is kind of cold which is kind of pristine, if you want. So there are some experiments with crystal plasticity. They show this first nucleation peak that they call pristine to pristine transition. When you nucleate massively, when uh, you, you load practically elastically the crystal, then it becomes unstable and uh, you nucleate massively dislocations that all go to the boundary and the stress drops uh, almost to zero. So there are experiments like this showing this massive event. And in a sense, this is an event that we are trying to simulate. We are collecting all points here, and then we see how it spreads. Uh, now, in reality, of course, there are many defects. They, they get uh, stuck. Uh, so you never have this kind of uh, uh, cool state uh, uh, prepared. You have initial dislocation. But uh, this is for the purpose of illustration. Uh, now, I, I, I think that for microcrystals, it's, it's a realistic uh, situation. Like you may look at this so-called pristine to pristine uh, uh, transitions. Those are massive uh, events. I'm sorry, just yes. I would like to ask you about the, what the parameter which is responsible to the velocity of this spread of dislocation. Or for example, if you go to the real material, what you should change it? to go from one material to another, how many dislocations? Okay, so uh, velocity here, you see we are doing quasi-static uh, uh, process, but of course there is this viscosity that was already in, in Prandtl model. Here it's a kind of, in, in, uh, during this avalanche, there is a numerical time where we do like steepest descent or something like this that imitates viscous uh, relaxation. So, so this is the time scale uh, of this uh, process. So we, in a sense, this model is not emphasizing kinetics of the motion because it views this kinetic as, in a sense, infinitely fast at the scale of the, of the application of external loads. So 
we don't want we don't necessarily want to go inside the avalanche and 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 see the uh, uh, reproduce adequately all the details because for this you need to model the the dissipative process in 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 full detail our dissipative process essentially numerical minimization of the energy uh, just i wanted you know to understand for example if you change aluminum to tungsten it's completely different so what i what you should change in your model. Yeah, uh, this energy, uh, uh, you see, uh, uh, okay, uh, here, this is a, this is an interatomic potential, but you may have more, like we've he heard yesterday, that one can come up with a much more, uh, but uh, also complex with multi-particle interaction schemes that would uh, <coughs> differentiate between different uh, materials, yes? But the, uh, uh, if we are in FCC, uh, if we are in particular crystallographic symmetry, the location of the wells uh, uh, cannot be changed. It only affects the nature of the barriers between the, uh, the wells. So the major symmetry is, is given by the crystallographic symmetry of the lattice. But the barriers, of course, they control this kinetics and all this, so they are... Uh, they, they are material dependent. Okay. Uh, now, we also did a simulation of indentation and compare it also with molecular statics. So there are some examples, but uh, I, I don't think I have time to go in details, but we did comparison with molecular statics. We also have uh, these intermittent fluctuations here and uh, um, also uh, power laws are recovered. But maybe I'll, I'll just uh, uh, say a few words about, also you have a cell formation. Uh, I'll uh, uh, say a little bit more that uh, how this method allows you also to see some important microscopic aspects that our uh, material scientists uh, have been studying for a while. So. For instance, if you look at a pure shear, uh, before we looked at uh, some simple shear paths, pure shear path is not along the uh, valley of the... Uh, and so as a result, uh, uh, for instance, this is elastic deformation. You have this dramatic drop, as I said, almost uh, 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 to, to zero, but not exactly to zero because uh, even though uh, stress is relaxed by, by adjustment, by development of these dislocations, not exactly to zero because some dislocations remain because the system forms the grain structure. So all these grains are effectively concentration of configurational points in the bottoms of the equivalent energy wells. That's, and they look like rotations, but between them there are still remain some kind of uh, dislocation that uh, form grain boundaries, and uh, that uh, ensures that there is still some energy uh, here. This is how it happens in stages. Uh, I don't have much time. Uh, we analyze this uh, decomposition patterns. For instance, you see here there are two grains, there is a relative rotation, and it turns out that the relative disorientation of these angles is special, and these boundaries are quite localized. Turns out that this is a so-called sigma-5 uh, grain boundary, which was known to crystallographers. But we also found that inside the grains, what looks like rotation is, in fact, is a micro-twinning. And one can compute uh, uh, by looking at uh, rank one connections, the orientations uh, of these corresponding laminates and their uh, uh, and you, 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 you can predict how those uh, grain boundaries would be oriented. So one important uh, fact here is that the rotations, what looks like rotations here, you see that here we only see atoms, so we don't see the history. So it looks like this grain and this grain just rotated, and there's a finite rotations, like 30, almost 37 degrees. It's a so-called high angle. Uh, boundary, but when you look at uh, the method allows us to see the history of individual elements and you see that in fact it's a micro twinning 
And in fact, this shows how this micro-tweening develops. It's a propagation of the, of the interface. Again, here, I, I have to say a few words. So this is a square well. What's shown in black is uh, what we call apparent yield surface. It's the kind of uh, boundary where strong ellipticity of the continuum <laughs> equation breaks. So if we operate it in continuum mechanics, not in a discrete model, then we would have, we would be kind of elastically stable everywhere inside this neighborhood. Now, in reality, we have a discrete system, but this, uh, and this would be a kind of a, a pure shear of this type. So when we go in this direction, we deform it like this, but then at some point when it's get out somewhere near this apparent yield surface, I say it apparent because there is no yield surface in this model. As soon as you are out of this kind of domain of ellipticity, the different elements, depending on the environment and kind of non-local uh, background, they transform uh, to another well because they become unstable. So it's a kind of diffuse area of yield. And, uh, uh, and for instance, it, it, it's instead of this homogeneous state, it breaks into mixture of these two wells, uh, which uh, means that it's, it's a laminate. And that's how this laminate grows. And I think I have a movie. Uh, uh, I know. Yeah, uh, maybe showing how you see the dislocations move uh, transversely. And then finally, you have basically a rotated grain. It's just that one defect is left here. But it's, uh, uh, it's, that's what is behind this rotation. And we even made a simple scalar model showing this type of uh, propagation. So that's a front leaving be on one side. It's a deformed lattice and uh, homogeneously. And on the other side, it's a laminate that is uh, made out of uh, uh, two equivalent energy wells out of infinitely many. OK, I will, uh, I don't have time here. Uh, I, uh, now, uh, what we see is if you draw, if you try to present velocity field, which is just a kind of displacement field from initial state to the final state, you have quite a complex pattern here, and you have some kind of vertices here. And we did analysis that usually is done in turbulence theory for the velocity field, and we see scaling. This is a correlation function for velocity. This is a distribution of the velocity gradients. So there are many features. I have no time to go deeper, but there is a paper on this uh, showing that there are many features of this kind of post-avalanche state that uh, uh, show that it's a highly correlated uh, structure that is uh, formed as a result of this interaction of dislocations, both long range and short range. Um, so I guess I have to finish. So kind of we observe this type of patterns. Uh, this is more magnified. So we can talk about plastic turbulence. Now I have some part of the talk on this automaton, discrete automaton, which is in scalar cases very easy to represent. Uh, yeah. Uh, we, uh, we studied, for instance, the role of uh, these models uh, allow you to study the role of uh, uh, quenched disorder and to show, to explain somehow non-universality because people are seeing different type of exponents in, in power laws here. And uh, this model explains this non-universality, identifies something that can be called a critical point here. Uh, also, you can consider cyclic uh, loading. But uh, so now the challenge is in 3D, because in 3D, the energy landscape is uh, the uh, elementary energy space is five dimensional, not, not two dimensional like here. And this shows preliminary sections of this uh, uh, energy landscape in, in 2D.
So it's kind of becoming very complex, but that's where the kind of electronic methods would be needed to reconstruct this landscape. But again, there is a hidden periodicity here. You need just uh, to kind of machine learn the small neighborhood, which is elastic, and then you automatically spread it all over by symmetry. Okay, so the conclusions. So basically, we start with this type of models. We get some complexity that's comparable to turbulence, which in a sense means that this language is adequate for, for uh, this type of uh, mesoscopic language, uh, even though you blur some of the details at the micro scale, but it basically captures the interaction, short range interaction between dislocations sufficiently to allow them to self organize in this way. So geometric nonlinearity is very important. There is no yield surface. There is no flow rule. There is a quantized plastic strain. There is a matrix valued spins. You come up with discrete automaton if you, if you can approximate wells by, uh, say, par parabolas. And that gives apparently adequate description of plastic fluctuations. Thank you.